Welcome to the next part of multi-rate signal processing. This time continuing on features and on window function windows. So last time we saw how we can obtain the impulse response of the ideal low pass filter, the brick wall filter, which was then the sync function. The problem of this impulse response is that it is non-causal and we also cannot make a causal because it starts at minus infinity because we cannot add an infinite delay. Well, at, at least it's not practical. Assume we would like to have a causal finite impulse response filter, FIR, meaning the impulse response starts at time zero and extends over only a finite amount of samples, so for a given length of L. So lowercase n, our index and time would run from zero to L minus one. Observe that FIR filters have no correspondence in the analog domain. Analog filters always have an infinite impulse response, well, at least theoretically, and uh, that corresponds to an infinite impulse response, short IIR. So how do we design this filter such that it becomes similar in some sense to the desired ideal, since we cannot get the actual ideal filter? An example here is design an anti-aliasing filter for sampling rate conversion. The original signal is from ACD with a 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate, hence an audio bin bandwidth of about 20 kilohertz. Right? Remember the Nyquist frequency was 22.05 kilohertz and we need to have a little distance from this um, Nyquist frequency for our audio frequencies. Yeah, and we would like to downsample it to 22 kilohertz sampling rate, for example, for a Macintosh computer. In order to, to, um, to be able, in order to be able to downsample it, we first have to low pass filter it, for instance, the pass band should be from 0 to 9 kilohertz and the stop band to avoid aliasing of frequency above 11 kilohertz should start from 11 kilohertz and then go to the Nyquist frequency which is here 22.05 kilohertz. Right. So remember Nyquist states first we need to low pass filter and then the stop band should start at the future Nyquist frequency, which would be 11 kilohertz, right? When we have 22 kilohertz future sampling rate, then 11 kilohertz would be the future Nyquist frequency. And then the stop band go on until, um, up to the maximum, which we have at the current sampling frequency, which is here, the Nyquist frequency, the current Nyquist frequency, 22.05 kilohertz. So since we don't have an ideal filter, we need to include this transition band here from the end of the pass band, 9 kilohertz, to the beginning of the stop band, 11 kilohertz. And this is to let the filter transition from pass band, from passing, to the stop band, to stopping the signal with intermediate attenuations. So any real filter needs some space to go from passing to stopping and this is the transition band. So here we give it 2 kilohertz for this transition. And it turns out the wider this transition band we allow um, the more attenuation we will get from this filter. So it's actually good to have a wide transition band. But on the other hand we don't want to make it too wide because that means we lose bandwidth in the uh, pass band. So we need to have a good compromise here. So for that, for that compromise, we need to know how much attenuation we actually need, right? And we don't need much more than what we then um, need for attenuating the alias components. So aliasing, it turns out, is something that is easily perceivable by, by the ear. So unfortunately, it's easily perceivable. And hence, you would like to have at least 60 dB attenuation from 11 kilohertz up. So this is our goal. This at least 60 dB. Otherwise, if we have less, then we can assume that we have audible 
aliasing components. The passband can take some ripples in the frequency response uh, because uh, for that the ear is uh, not so sensitive. For instance, plus minus 2 dB is still okay. Um, so this again comes from experience, uh, from what the ear can um, detect. So this corresponds to about plus minus 25% in voltage. So when you look at it in the voltage domain, it's actually quite a lot. 2 dB doesn't sound so lot anymore, or doesn't sound so much anymore. The frequency range from 9 kHz to 11 kHz, again, is called the transition band. And this gives us the space to build up the attenuation going from 0 to 60 dB to make sure that it's already um, at the 6 dB at 11 kHz frequency. Right, and <clears throat> also the 2 dB ripple in the passband, uh, the more ripples we allow in the passband, um, the more attenuation we can get in the stop band. So this is again a trade-off which we can make. If we allow more ripples in the passband, then we also get more attenuation in the stop band. So basically you could say more ripples in the pass band leads to smaller ripples in the stop band. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so in this way we can formulate requirements for a similarity of our filter, even though we know, um, we know that we cannot reach the optimum. So this is a practical approach. We, we know what compromises we are willing to make. So a first, perhaps naive approach is to define the similarity as the quadratic error of the frequency response of our FIR filter to our given ideal frequency response. Mostly this means the magnitude of the frequency response. So this has the advantage of being mathematically very simple. This means our goal is to minimize this quadratic error. So this also means that we treat all the errors equally, no matter if they are in the stop band, transition band, or the pass band. Assume our desired frequency response is HD of omega, and the real frequency response of our causal filter is H of omega. Then this quadratic error E is as defined in this equation here, right? We have the desired frequency response, this is the ideal, brick wall filter and this h of omega is then what we get from our fir implementation and there's a difference right they are not the same and so we take the difference take the magnitude and square it and then um, using this integral going over all frequencies from zero to, to pi we basically compute the average right so here basically we take this square difference no matter where it is, no matter where in the frequency response. And this is actually, as you will see also, the shortcoming of this method, that it treats all, equal, all frequencies equally. So in Python, uh, we can compute it using, again, our frexy function here. And it takes our coefficients h, then here, one is the IR part, since we have an FIR filter, we have it one, so there's nothing else here. And then frac samples is the samples in the um, frequency domain. Here is the desired frequency response. Simply we concatenate um, the passband. Here's all one, ones in the passband. And then here in, we have zeros in the um, stop band. So which is basically everything except for the pass band. Yeah, and then we can compute the difference and compute the sum. Right, so this is basically how we would do it in Python. So we would like to make this E as small as possible. Observe that we need an integral here because the frequency domain signal is continuous, right? So unlike here in my Python example, here we have discrete samples, but these samples need to be fine enough um, in order to approximate this integral well enough, right? 
So basically, we need to um, um, approximate this integral by finite samples here, because otherwise we cannot really do it numerically. Yeah, so the frequency domain signal is continuous since the time domain signal is not periodic. Only then would the Fourier transform be discrete over the frequency. But now we assume that we have basically a non-periodic, infinitely long signal. But here we have the sync function with infinite extent over time. Observe that because of this we cannot apply the discrete Fourier transform because it is made for periodic signals with a finite period, right? So even though we have a finite filter, finite length filter, the sync function is still infinite. So the DFT is usually applied just to this finite period. But the discrete time Fourier transform is for discrete time signals with infinite period, like the sync function which we have here. So we need to minimize the quadratic error E to find the best approximation with our FIR filter. We cannot solve this problem in the frequency domain, but we can solve the equivalent formulation in the time domain um, for this minimization. Right? So this is um, kind of a mathematical trick. To obtain this, we use the so-called Parseval theorem. And this states that the power of a signal, the sum of its magnitude squares, is the same in the time and in the frequency domain. Right? So this is a property of the Fourier transform that it um, um, keeps uh, and maintains this power. This is true for the discrete time Fourier transform as well as for the DFT. So that means if you compute this mean squared error in the frequency domain here, right? so this is basically the average power of the error, then it's the same if you compute it in the time domain. So here we compute again the power of the, the error power, but now between the two impulse responses. So here HD is now our sync function, the desired impulse response, and H is now the still unknown impulse response of our FIR filter, which we want to use um, to approximate the idea. Right? And this also shows us now we're actually coming closer to the solution, because here we can almost see the solution by looking at the differences. Yeah, and for Parseval theorem, we really need this squaring function, right? Because the squaring need, uh, leads to the power. The energy here, um, the beauty here is now that we obtain a sum, um, which we now can compute more easily. Remember, we want to obtain h of n. So here on the right hand side, basically, we can now more easily see how to obtain h of n. So how do we minimize this sum on the right hand side? Well, remember h of n is finite, so it covers only some of the samples of h. But the samples that it covers, we should choose h identical to hd. Right? And we should choose h such that it covers the largest samples of hd then we minimize um, the rest that it doesn't cover. Right? So basically this gives us or, or now a um, simple solution by inspection. Yeah, so for our ideal low pass filter, HD was a sync function, as I just mentioned. To obtain a causal filter, we already allowed a time shift, ND, for the ideal impulse response, which means using our FR filter H um, uh, to become causal. And plugging this into the above equation yields this result. So here we have now a shifted sync function. So we have a shift by nd samples, basically such that we can then allow n to start at zero, right? So we don't want to start at n minus infinity, but basically at n equals zero. And then we choose nd such that this h covers uh, the largest values of the sync function. Yeah, so how should we choose h of n and the delay nd to obtain this minimum possible quadratic error for a given length l of h of n? Well, given the length l, 
we need to determine the L coefficients h of n and the delay parameter nd, basically in the way that I just mentioned. To make the solution more easy to see, we can divide the sum into two parts, one over the extent of h of n and one for the rest. So this is what I mentioned. This first sum is the part that h covers. Right? So here we have this shifted sink function minus h of n. And here we can simply choose h of n identical to this first part and then it disappears, right? It becomes zero and this first sum disappears. And then we have the second sum, which is containing all the coefficients of the sink function, uh, which h is not covering. So in this case, all the indices smaller than zero and all the indices larger than l minus one. So that means to minimize the second part, we just need to choose nd, uh, which minimizes it. And this shows us that we just need to choose nd such that the large coefficients appear in the first sum here, so that the second sum contains the smaller coefficients. So basically, um, the main ripple of the sink function should appear in this part of the sum, which is covered by h, and then uh, the side ripples should appear here in the second sum. So that also means the h should contain the main ripples of the sink function. Yeah, so this is described here. Both terms are positive, so to minimize e, we have to minimize both terms. To minimize the right-hand term, we only have nd, the shift, we can choose nd such that only the smallest values appear there and that the biggest values of hd are not seen by the right-hand sum and covered by hn in the left-hand sum. We can imagine the left-hand sum being a so-called rectangular window where we can shift the sink function over this window to obtain h of n. So here, the sum here is looking over a window from n equals zero to n minus one and in this window, uh, we have h of n identical to this sink function, this shifted sink function. Yeah, the rectangular window is a function which has the value 1 inside the window length, because we choose h identical to the sink inside this window, and the value 0 outside the window length. Well, outside our FRR filter is 0. That's why the window then implicitly has um, the factor zero. The finite sum can be imagined as resulting from first multiplying the infinite sink function with this rectangular window, basically zeroing out everything outside of this window, and then compute the sum which becomes finite. The goal here would be to shift the sink function using the delay nd such that the window for h of n sees the biggest values of the sink function. Observe that this leads to a continuous impulse response. Using the above formulas, it would also be possible to just pick the biggest magnitude values of the sink function for h, the maxima and minima, for a non-contiguous impulse response, where you basically have values and then zeros in between, which would lead to a smaller quadratic error for L coefficients which would be kind of an unusual filter. So a question here, how would the resulting frequency response look like? Yeah, so I leave that to you. Assume we have L equals 2. So again, a tiny window. Then we have a filter with just two coefficients. The biggest two values in the sink function are around the center, around 0, right? So when you look at the sink, we have the main lobe, and the main lobe contains the two largest values, which we choose here now. And um, the center has the largest value, the center is zero, so we could shift um, by nd equals 0.5, and then we get uh, the two largest values. So basically we shift by half a sample. We have a delay of half a sample. And remember, we can do that because the sink function is a con continuous function, so we can also delay by half a sample. Yeah, and so in this way the new center is around n equals 
0.5, right? So half a sample shift. And the right hand sum sees only the smaller values. So basically everything else. In general, we would like to choose nd equals l minus 1 divided by 2, which means we shift the sync function in the middle of our FIR filter window. Right? We have this FIR filter window and we want to appear uh, the main lobe uh, inside our window impulse response, in, inside our uh, window. Yeah, meaning we shift the maximum of the sync function exactly in the center of our window function for h of n. So what do we do with the left hand side inside our window? We choose h of n identical to hd of n and the left hand sum with the window becomes indeed zero. Right, easy enough. This way we get a simple recipe for designing an FIR filter with minimum squared error. We take the center of the sync function or the ideal impulse response HD, so it could also be a high pass filter or a band pass filter, the recipe would still apply, and window it with a so-called rectangular window as we just did, because it has um, a rectangular form in time or space. Inside the sum for h of n, this imagined window has a value of 1 and outside a value of 0, as I mentioned before. So here's this window in this picture. So here is our sync function, this black line. Right. Here is um, our index 0 for our filter h. Then we shift the sync function by L minus 1 divided by 2, where L is the filter length, the desired filter length of our filter. Here we can see the length of our filter and this rectangular window right here is 1 inside this window and it's 0 outside. And then to obtain our filter impulse response for this FIR filter, we keep all the values inside this window. We multiply all the values with 1. And then we multiply all the values outside with zero. So then the outside values become zero and we can ignore them, right? So all we have left with is the values inside this window. And um, yeah, the value zeros um, can be dropped, can be ignored. This imagined window function will become more interesting if we modify the values from one to other values. And then this um, a window function becomes more interesting. So we can see FIR filter results from sync function times the rectangular window. Yeah, so observe, we only use a finite piece of the sync function as our filter. We implicitly already applied a rectangular window. So basically by simply dropping all the values, we implicitly applied this rectangular window. So in this case, there is no need to apply it explicitly anymore. So if you do it in Python, you don't need to multiply it by this rectangular window. In Python, you would do it by just removing all the un unwanted samples. Yeah, so this multiplication of the rectangular window with the ideal impulse response in the time domain becomes a convolution of the DFT, DTFT of the rectangular window with the ideal frequency response in the frequency domain. So this is the case where this rectangular window mathematically becomes interesting again, because what we do in the time domain with the multiplication becomes a convolution in the frequency domain. And in this way we can predict the result, right? And in this way we can see the result in the frequency domain. In effect, the ideal frequency response of the sync function, which was this brick wall filter, is now blurred by convolving it with a DTFT of our rectangular window function. Right? And the rectangular window function in the time domain now becomes a sync function in the frequency domain. So now we have the ideal rectangular filter in the frequency domain and we convolve it with another sync and then we get ripples at the edges.
right? And those ripples is what you actually don't really want. So ideally, this DTFT of the window should become an impulse at frequency zero, because then the convolution would not change the ideal frequency response. So if it's just one impulse at zero, then we are fine, right? But this would mean an infinitely long window in the time domain, right? If we have a Dirac at frequency zero, which means this means we have an infinitely long window in time. So not good because this would mean an infinitely long window in the time domain. We have a finite rectangular window in the time domain, which becomes another sync function in the frequency domain, which is quite different from the pulse and frequency zero. So observe, the longer the window in the time domain, the more narrow its sync function in the frequency domain becomes. Right? So this is what we know from the Fourier transforms. When we have a wide rectangle, then this results in a narrow sync function and vice versa. Yeah, so when we have a wider window in the time domain, then it becomes more similar to an impulse and hence for better filters, we need a longer window, right? So this is the first trade-off we see. When we have long windows, we get better filters, closer to um, the ideal. So L equals two was a nice example, but it's too short. So let's make it longer, L equals 16. So here's an example for L equals 16. So again, here a PyLab example. So first, this is a um, rectangle here, H. So it contains 16 ones and then four zeros. And then we can plot it and this is what we get, right? 16 bonds followed by some zeros. And then the resulting frequency response is using the Frexy function with its internal DTFT. So now you can imagine this um, H being our window of length 16. So again, we're using our signal our library, which contains Frexy, then we come compute Frexy of our window H, plot it in the dB with dB numbers 20 times log base 10. So we assume that magnitude H corresponds to a voltage or a current. Here we um, scale the axis um, accordingly. We give it labels and then this is the result, right? So here's our rectangular window now in the frequency domain. You can see it, it's not really a, uh, an impulse at frequency zero. It has a width, it has a main lobe, and it also has side lobes, right? And those side lobes are not really very, very much down. You can see here, here would be the peak of um, the pass band, for instance, and then goes down to 10, maybe a little bit more than 10. So we have maybe 15 dB attenuation. So here we can see that it is far from being an impulse at frequency zero. In fact, it is somewhat broad and also the attention is not very high on the order of minus 15 to minus 20 dB. So we expect our, that our resulting low pass filter will inherit these properties through the convolution in the frequency domain. So remember, we have to convolve our ideal frequency response with this, right? And that means basically on the edges, we get this behavior basically. And that means we have our stop attenuation basically spoiled by this uh, very high side lobes here. Yeah, so the passband or main lobe width of our window function will determine the transition bandwidth of our resulting filter. Because if we convolve it if you convolve our brick wall filter now with this um, sync function here, that basically the edge becomes also widened by this main lobe. Right? The edge is not going down immediately, but this the transition bandwidth is determined by the width of this main lobe here of this sync in the frequency domain. Yeah, so here, this sets the transition bandwidth 
And this also shows when we have uh, uh, broader windows, that means uh, we get more narrow sinks and that means the transition bandwidth will become less. Right? So this is also an interesting property when we make our filter longer, that means the transition bandwidth becomes less. Right? Yeah, and also we see the stop at attenuation of the window will it determine the resulting stop at attenuation of our filter. So that's this. Right? And also interesting is that um, even if we make our um, window wider, we get a sync function which becomes more narrow, but those ripples, those ripples become also more narrow, but they don't become smaller, right? And that's um, the so-called Gibbs phenomenon, which we will see in a moment. Yeah, this shows that the window function shapes the key characteristics of our resulting FIR filter. So the window is actually quite important. The width determines the transition bandwidth, the ripples determining the resulting passband attenuation, and uh, the, uh, the ripple height is determined by the shape of uh, the window, as we will see soon. So here's an example. Take our example of a downsampling filter which should attenuate frequencies starting at 11 kilohertz. Right? So this is the beginning at the stop band. At a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz. We would like to have minus 60 dB attenuation in the stop band. Hence, we obtain the normalized frequency for the start of our stop band as follows. Here we have our normalized stop band frequency. So we have 11 kilohertz divided by 44.1 kilohertz times two pi. All right, so this is our angular frequency normalized to 44.1 kilohertz sampling frequency. And this is roughly 0.5 times p pi. All right, so it's not exactly 0.5, it's, it's roughly 0.5 pi. So hence our desired frequency response is 1 between frequency 0 and omega s, or better between minus omega s to plus to omega s, to also include the negative frequency axis because that's what we need for the inverse um, DTFT. So now we take the inverse DTFT of the ideal desired frequency response HD of omega to obtain the ideal impulse response HD. So this is the first step for our filter design and um, also note that up to this point we didn't really take into account any transition band. Right? We just specified omega s from the beginning of our stop band. So we have to check later if it fits. So first this is our first guess and then we see what we get. And then we have to see if we have to increase the filter length, for instance, to get more attenuation or um, more narrow transition bands. Right, so we can easily get HD from this omega s by applying the inverse DTFT. So since at first we assume an ideal filter, we set the end of the pass band omega c identical to the beginning of the stop band omega c equals omega s. As I just mentioned, we neglect the transition band up to now. So this is what we get then, right? We can just plug it in. So the inverse DTFT becomes quite easy because um, this is an easy frequency response. We just need to integrate from minus omega c to plus omega c, where this becomes one. Then all what's left is this transform kernel here and this transform kernel is also easily integrated. It has those integrals here. And then we can see this result here um, is a sine divided by pi n, so a sync function. Right, so this is our ideal impulse response. Again, infinitely long. Yeah, remember sine of omega is 1 divided by 2j of e to the j omega minus e to the minus j omega, or um, it's just the imaginary part of e to the j omega. Right. 
Yeah, now assume we would like to have a filter length of L equals 16, so just as a first guess. Then our delay to make the resulting filter causal would be ND equals L minus 1 over 2, which would be 7.5. So we can plug it in here into our ideal impulse response, and this is what we get. So here, uh, and then we can apply our window. That means applying our window is not very easy. We just limit our index from 0 to 15. So here we shift our ideal, apply our window to get this finite range. So this is now our resulting causal FIR filter with a rectangular window function. So this is now our solution. So now we have to test it. Right? So here we can do it in PyLab conveniently. N is a range 16, so we get numbers from 0 to 15, which is again exactly this index range here. Note that I'm taking a range instead of range. A range gives me um, integer or float numbers and uh, range in Python 3 is really an index range. So it's not really, uh, not necessarily a sequence of um, numbers. So a range makes it really a number to which I can apply this under sign function too. So here we can see it. I basically just take um, the above formula here. So here omega c, remember, was 0 0.5 times pi. Then here we have our n minus 7.5. And here in the numerator, in the denominator, we have pi times n minus 7.5. And we can plot it. And here we can see, indeed, we get the center of a sync function. Right? So this looks like a sync function a sample sync function, the largest values appear in the center, and here we have a length of 15 samples. Right? So now what's more interesting is the frequency response. So now we have our um, filter, the SI. So here we call it SI. So again, we use SciPy signal, and we apply the Frexy function. And um, yeah, let me just try it. So now we can open a window, a terminal shell. So make a font a little larger. So start IPython minus lab. Okay, so now n equals a range 16. So now gives this gives our index range, the numbers from 0 to 15. And now we have this formula here, which I just copy and paste for convenience. I hope that works. Sometimes it doesn't because it gives um, sometimes strange um, um, fonts. Yeah, this works. So here we have SI. This is an array of the um, of um, the impulse response coefficients, and now we can plot it. Plot of SI, and indeed we get our impulse response, which looks nicely like a sample sync function with the largest values in the center. So now I import SciPy signal. Oh, that was wrong. Copy. Copy. Paste. No. My copying action is not working. Copy. Based not works. Okay, and I think here I'm missing the SP. Let me check. Yes, so this should be SP dot because Frexy resides in the library signal. So this should be SP dot so that it knows in which library it is located.
Yeah, and then we can plot the resulting frequency response and label the axis and scale the axis. So paste. Yes. So this is what we then get. So this is now our low pass. Here we see the pass band. The pass band has some ripples. So again, you can see the values down here, the lower right hand side when I go over it with my mouse pointer. So we start at y equals minus 0.4, goes up to 0.59, minus 0.6. Yeah. So the ripples here are not too big. So we have ripples um, less than plus minus 1 dB. So we saw that this um, is usually okay. No problem with the ripples in the pass band. We start here at frequency zero, uh, at attenuation zero, at frequency zero. And then here in the stop band, basically 0.5 pi should be the start of our stop band. So here, let's take a look at 0.5 pi, which was here. And we can see here 0.5 pi is roughly here. And we get minus, minus 5 dB attenuations. So it's not enough. So even if you look here, we get minus 23, minus 31, minus 38. So we can see this is a low pass, but it's not good enough. Right, it's it's not sufficient. So this is kind of disappointing. Right? So again here, this is the plot that we just saw. So the pass band has ripples of about plus minus 0.5 dB. And um, 0.5 dB corresponds to a factor of roughly 1.06, which means only 6% over or undershoot, and this is usually okay. Right? As I mentioned, 2 dB is, is, should be still okay. But here we can also see that this filter has maybe minus 10 dB attenuation at normalized frequency 0.5. We saw actually it's less, it's something like minus, minus 6 dB. So that's bad. And the first side lobe has only minus 20 dB attenuation. Hence it does not satisfy our requirements of at least minus 60 dB attenuation starting at normalized frequency 0.5 pi, right? So that's not good. Yeah, now we can also take a look at the phase plot. Let me just copy and paste it here conveniently in my little IPython window. So here's now the phase plot and we see it's indeed a linear function of the phase with the usual wrap around at plus minus pi. Yeah, so we have a delay of nd equals 7.5 with our filter. And since uh, this is a so-called linear phase filter, I guess I can uh, remove the so-called because we already talked about it we expect the phase to be minus 7.5 times omega. And we can verify this in our plot, for instance, at frequency omega equals 0 0.3. In our plot at axis 0 x axis 0 0.3, we, can, uh, we expect then a value of minus 7.5 times 0.3, which is minus 2.25. So let's check. So we can go to, maybe I should plot it again here to make it more easy to see. So we have omega 0.3. So watch the number on the right hand side. Lower right hand side here is 0.3. And let's see. Yeah, so here we get roughly minus point, minus 2.29 um, or minus 2.3. So let's see, yeah, it fits. So this is about what we see. Yeah, so we have a linear phase filter. It's just not enough attenuation. So now we have a filter with a minimum squared error in comparison with our given ideal. But is this really what we like to have? 
Right? The problem is, the problem that we get is called the Gibbs phenomenon. So this is basically what we what I just mentioned, looking at the frequency response of our window. There we saw the uh, the ripples um, have a given height, and this given height determines or limits the stop attenu attenuation. So the Gibbs phenomenon says that the error appears as ripples along the magnitude of the pass band and the stop band. The interesting part is that the ripples near the pass band and the stop band edge don't become smaller as the filter length L becomes larger. Uh, we get a smaller error in the approximation, but they only become more narrow. Right? So when we, become, when we make L larger, we have a smaller error. Right? But this smaller error is only reflected by those uh, ripples becoming more narrow. Right? Then they have less power in it, but they still have the same height. Right? That's the problem. And this is not what we want for our filters. We really want to reduce the height. So this is the result of convolving our ideal frequency response with a sync function from the rectangular window. This sync function only becomes narrower as we increase the filter the length L, but the height of the ripples stays the same. And this means the maximum error that we obtain does not become smaller as we increase L, which is bad, right? We cannot say simply make the filter L um, filter length L larger, then it will get better because that's not the case. Um, we will have um, basically just a, a more narrow transition bandwidth, but not more attenuation. So the ripple size near the pass band and the stop band edge only becomes more narrow, hence we have a reduced area and hence reduced quadratic error, but the height does not become smaller with increasing L. So here they always stay around um, 0.1 in the stop band, which corresponds to only about minus 20 dB. Right. So uh, which would not be sufficient in our aliasing filter example. So if we make the filter longer and longer, we shrink the sync function and eventually the attenuation will become larger. Um, but only slowly so. And um, again, we would have um, a wider transition um, area in this way. Yeah, to see how the Gibbs phenomenal result, we, uh, we can take a look at our scheme in the frequency domain. Right? In principle, we multiplied our ideal impulse response with a rectangular window. Right? In the frequency domain, this means convolution of the ideal frequency response with a frequency response of the rectangular window. And the latter is a narrow sync function with corresponding ripples to the size of its main lobe. And those ripples are what shows up as Gibbs phenomenon. If you make our window longer and larger, the sync function becomes more narrow, as I mentioned, but the height of the ripples does not decrease. They stay the same. Actually, in most applications, what we want is not minimizing the quadratic error, but minimizing the maximum error, right? So basically, we chose the wrong error measure, right? So this is also what um, easily can happen in engineering when we have an optimization problem, right? Uh, so often when we have an optimization problem, the mean squared error comes to mind first because that's the easiest, but then often um, it's not really what you want, right? For instance, in audio, like in this example, uh, when we want to suppress the alias coefficients or the alias artifacts, we really want to maximize, uh, minimize the maximum error instead of the quadratic error. Right? And this is often um, the case in optimizations. You really want to choose the right error function or the right objective function for an optimization. Yeah, this also suggests a modification to lower the height of the ripples. Instead of rectangular window, we can take alternative windows which have lower ripples in the frequency domain. Commonly used windows are the so-called raised cosine or the sine windows. Yeah, and this is um, what comes um, in the next part. So for now, thanks for your attention and see you in the next part.